mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment I wake up Till I lay my head I will sing Of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good Every breath I will say of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. In darkest nights, you are close like no other. Known you as a father. Known you as a friend, I have lived in the goodness of God. Yes, and all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so. Ah uh -huh. 
Good morning, Trinity. We are so excited to worship Jesus together this morning from right where we are. And we know that when we praise him, the Holy Spirit unites us as the body of Christ. In Psalm 145, it says that the Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving towards all he has made. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. So let's draw near to him in worship right now. Blessed are those who run to him, who place their hope and confidence in Jesus. He won't forsake them. Blessed are those who seek his face, who bend their knee and fix their gaze on Jesus. They won't be shaken. So come on and praise the Lord with me. Sing if you Whose hearts are set on pilgrimage with Jesus, they'll see his glory. Blessed are those who die to live, whose joy it is to give it all for Jesus and for him only. Oh, Jesus, all for your glory. Every chance I get, I bless your name. 
gather in this way wherever we are this morning and come into your presence, experience your peace, and know that you are with us. Lord, I pray right now that wherever we are, you would just fill our hearts with a sense of gratitude toward you and expectation and expectancy for what you have for us in the new year. We look to you, Lord, and we bring to you all those things that are weighing on us at this moment. Lord, for anyone here who is grieving or brokenhearted, I pray your comfort. For anyone who needs your healing hand, Lord, I pray that you would minister, that you would move, that you would anoint them right now, wherever they are, that they would experience your power. And Lord, for those places in the world that are so lacking in your peace, we pray that you would move, that you would bring an end to war and hostilities, that you would bring your peace, your shalom. Lord, we ask that now in your name. And Father, I pray that as we continue in this service, you would fill our hearts with delight in you, with the ability just to let go of distraction and experience more of you. Give us hearts that are turned toward you, that just want to worship you. Thank you that we can carve out this time on this day and in this way. So we give you the rest of this time and we pray in the power of your mighty name, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Meg. I'm one of the pastors here at Trinity, and it is a delight to be gathering in this way this morning. If you just happen to stumble upon us on YouTube, we are so glad to have you join us. And if you'd like to learn more about who we are, we really encourage you to scan the QR code on this Connect card and give us some information so that we can reach out to you and let you know more about who we are. If you have been with us for a while or you're new, we also encourage you to take a moment to scan the card and write us a prayer request 
two things that are so important to us here at Trinity are connection and prayer. And it would, it would be our honor to be lifting up to the Lord the needs that are on your heart. So I encourage you to take a moment, a moment to do that now. If this is your church home or you're beginning to think that it might be, we really encourage you to take that next step. What next step might the Lord be leading you to do? Maybe it's just to start coming regularly on a Sunday, and we encourage you to do that if that's where you are. If the next step for you is to go beyond Sunday, we encourage you, especially in this new year, to look for opportunities to do that, and, and you'll be learning more about those opportunities over the next, next weeks. Or maybe if you have been involved and gone beyond Sunday and made connections and are growing in your faith, maybe the next step is to go beyond yourself, to look for ways to serve, either here at Trinity or with one of our, one of our Trinity Serves partners. You can learn about any of those next steps on the Next Steps tab on our website, trinitychurch.life, so I encourage you to check that out. One significant way that a lot of you have already taken that next step of going beyond yourself is in leading a group. Our next group's term the winter-spring term begins at the end of January. It runs for 12 weeks. And if the Lord might be nudging you to lead a group, I really encourage you to go to our website, fill out the information form so that we can reach out to you about what that might look like. We, we really encourage you to take some time to, to slow down after the busyness of this Christmas season and just spend some time with the Lord in prayer about what he might be leading you to do. And if it's specifically leading groups, we encourage you to reach out. We would love to have you. Of course, we are also really delighted to be back in person next week. We will be in person at our regular times in all of our regular locations next Sunday, and we can't wait to see you there in the new year. And of course, we also are really grateful for your generosity, for those of you who consider this your church home, for the ways that you give so faithfully, the way that you recognize that that is a spiritual discipline and that all that you have really belongs to the Lord. So thank you for those of you who give so faithfully for your generosity. If you would like to give a gift to Trinity, the ways that you can give are on the screen here. Um, and we are so grateful again, as I said, and recognize that all that is given to us is entrusted to us to do the Lord's work here through what we're doing at Trinity. And so we're grateful. And now we're going to turn to our scripture passage. Um, our scripture this morning is Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I'm going to confess something this morning that I don't really want to tell you, which is if you're watching this on Sunday, December 31st is my birthday. I hate to admit it because I don't really enjoy the spotlight, but I'm telling you uh, for a reason. You see, having a birthday on December 31st has some really interesting dynamics that go with it. On the one hand, everyone is celebrating with you. There's fireworks, there's celebrations, there's parties, all if you want to claim them in your honor. But on the other hand, there's this other funny thing that happens, because unlike most other birthdays, you're awake with your friends and your family the moment the clock strikes midnight, and suddenly, it's not your birthday anymore. And inevitably, someone makes a statement that says, you know what, we're not celebrating you anymore, the clock turned midnight, we can be a jerk to you just like we are normally. It's such a strange and weird thing. So the way that we mark time on our calendar makes today and makes tomorrow a really big deal. It's a rhythm and a, a practice and a moment in time that sort of creates an opportunity. Turning over uh, a new year brings with it all kinds of expectations and longings and desires. And perhaps even now you're thinking of some of them. I wonder, can I ask the question, what are your hopes and what are your dreams for 2024? Whether you name specific resolutions or you simply appreciate the chance for kind of a do-over, a fresh start and a new year makes us think. At the same time, we're also probably aware that resolutions can be short-lived. 
And that although the calendar changes over, there are a lot of ways that life continues exactly the way that it did before. Personally, I'm really bad at forgetting that it's a new year when I'm writing the date on forms or checks or whatever the thing is in the first few weeks. I guarantee that at least 10 times in the next few weeks, I'll write 2023 on a form when I should write 2024 before it embeds properly and deeply in my brain. I once heard a trainer at a gym that I was going to say in early January, yeah, it's packed right now, but look at this place on Valentine's Day, it'll be almost empty. All of which begs the question, how can life actually look different this year? How do I actually change? Because it's evident to most, if not all of us, sometimes through painful experiences, that human willpower isn't enough to change our lives. Simply deciding to make some kind of change generally does not work. There's more to it than that. So what does it actually look like to make a change? What does it actually look like to grow this year for real? Well, for the first six weeks of the year, we are going to explore that question through a brand new teaching series called The Intentional Life. And in that series, we are going to look at six different spiritual disciplines or practices. Now, why would we do that, you might ask? Is this just another New Year's resolution? Is this just another false start to leave us discouraged by the middle of February? Or is there something more? Well, that's what we're going to explore today. What does it mean to have an intentional life? Is it even possible to have an intentional life? And if so, how? Now, to help us on that journey over these first few weeks of the year, we have some resources that you can explore. Uh, the first is a book, uh, The Intentional Year by Glenn and Holly Packiam. And this covers some of those same spiritual disciplines that we're going to be walking through week by week in this series. And the book helps you to make an actual plan for drawing closer to God through spiritual practices for the year. So you can pick that up if that helps you. We've also got a couple of events. The first is 24-7 prayer, which we're holding on January 5 through 6. You can sign up for one hour of prayer, either in the Cosco prayer room at the Ministry Center or the Larchmont prayer room at Trinity Westchester. There'll be prompts to pray for yourself, to pray for our church, to pray for our region, and to pray for the world. So sign up for an hour of prayer. We'll pray continuously for 24 hours, 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. The other event is a workshop called Prophetic Word for the Year. Blessedly Matthews is going to lead us through a process of listening to the Lord and hearing His Word for our lives for the year. And so whether listening prayer is brand new to you or you're very experienced in it, I want to encourage you to seek God's heart for this year so you can come to that workshop, sign up ahead of time on the website, and there's some resources you'll get to be preparing your mind and your heart for that time. All three of those can help you kick off the new year and be intentional. This idea of the intentional life, though, is really the subject of the teaching text that we heard in Psalm 1. Psalm 1 describes two very different approaches to life and the results of those two approaches. On the one hand, we have the blessed person. And blessed here doesn't really mean fortunate or lucky or even happy. Blessed communicates something much deeper. It describes someone who's actively seeing the favor and grace of God at work in their real life. And we see the results of that person's walk with God in verse 3. It says, That person, the blessed person, is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Conversely, we're also presented with the path of what the psalmist calls the wicked. And we see the results of that way of living as well. Verse 4, not so the wicked, they are like the chaff that the wind blows away. Psalm 1, if you like, is this side-by-side -side of two very different approaches to life. One leads to blessing and to flourishing, and the other, very directly in the words of the psalmist in verse 6, leads to destruction. Elsewhere in Scripture, that same idea is described as the path that leads to life, versus the path that leads to death. The psalmist lays out this very clear choice. Which one do you want? You can have a verse three life, or you can have a verse four life. Both are available. Now, I don't know which way you answered that earlier question about hopes or dreams for 2024, but I would imagine on some level, that vision of life for the blessed person that we see in verse three speaks to it. 
Yes, the psalm is written in very poetic language, but it drives up some really real deep human longings, needs, and desires. That if you're exhausted right now, wouldn't it be incredible to be planted next to a stream of living, refreshing water and to rest there? If you're struggling today with your purpose or your calling or a need for guidance, wouldn't it be amazing to understand the season you're in and to look forward to fruitfulness in the future? If you feel alone or you've got a difficult relationship in your life, don't you want to feel planted and secure in who God's made you to be? If you need provision, don't you long to see yourself prosper? If you need a breakthrough in your health, wouldn't it be reassuring to know that you will not wither? Psalm 1 verse 3 presents us with a vision of flourishing and abundance and thriving in life. It's an amazing vision to look forward to and hope for. And at the same time, what's so interesting about Psalm 1 is not just the results that we see in verse 3, but everything that come before. Verses 1 and 2 tell us all about how the blessed person becomes blessed. It lays out the pathway to that outcome, and it's something quite unexpected. You see, if you grew up in my faith tradition, you would have an expectation of what Psalm 1, 1 to 2 should say. Here's what it should say in my tradition. Blessed is the one who believes the right doctrine. Blessed is the one who knows they're saved by grace and not their good works. In other words, if you get your theology right, there'll be sort of a cascade effect into the rest of your life. But that is not what the Psalm says at all. It actually says that this blessed person has a specific path to walk that what they do, how they live, the choices they make actually matter. Now, on the other hand, someone else might have a different set of expectations about what Psalm 1, 1 and 2 should say in order to get to the result of verse 3. They might say something like, blessed is the one who's morally upright, who's successful in their career, who's esteemed by their friends and their colleague. God looks down on those people and smiles. In other words, blessed is the person who strives to be good, who succeeds in earning the favor of God and others. But guess what? The psalm doesn't say that either. This psalm is neither about putting our hope and our trust in having the right doctrine, nor is about putting our hope and our trust in earning the favor of God through our morality. You see, the invitation at the core of Psalm 1 is to say this, to say an intentional yes to God and his ways. To say an intentional yes to God and his ways. Or in New Testament language, to say yes to the free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ, and in doing so, choose to live your life in his way. It's to let God in and to follow in the path that he has for our lives. To say yes to Jesus and to become his apprentice. In other words, to live an intentional life. To live an intentional life, not because we earn our salvation through doing so or anything like that, but because to live an intentional life with God is the will of the one who loves us and, in fact, is the very best way to live. You see, the contrast in Psalm 1 is both at the same time between the blessed and the wicked, between those who are in a relationship with God and those who reject him, and it's also about what it looks like to live an intentional life with God versus living life on autopilot or on default. It happens to me more than I care to admit that I will get in my car to drive away from my house with a full intention of making a stop for an errand on the way to the church office. But so often, I never actually make the stop. I arrive at the office having gotten there completely on muscle memory and autopilot, forgetting that I had any other plans. Maybe that happens to you sometimes too. And it's so very easy to do that same exact thing when it comes to our walk with God. But Psalm 1 encourages us about all the benefits of not being on autopilot, not on muscle memory, not on default, but having an intentional life with God. Now, at this moment in the message, I feel like I should give a health warning. Because in a minute, we're going to explore what does an intentional life with God look like? How can we do that in 2024? But we have to name some things that might be coming up for us in advance of that. 
You see, for some of you right now, you're in a very achievement-oriented posture. You've got a lot of zeal about this. As I share your thinking, that is right. I am going to crush 2024 as a Christian. I won't just be intentional about my faith. I will be extreme. I will be relentless. I will be disciplined about it. I will be the Navy SEAL of all these disciplines to come. And if you feel something like that welling up in you, I do love that that's the desire of your heart. And I would also encourage you not to trip into overachievement. Don't lose your passion for the things of God. Keep that, but avoid the tendency towards doing things for God instead of being with him. Become the person he's asking you to be, which most likely involves slowing down, most likely involves more than less rest, more than less Sabbath, and it involves a life of surrender rather than a life of outward success. So don't trip into overachievement. On the other hand, and perhaps this is more likely in our particular community and part of the world, there are perhaps some of us who are feeling right now just totally overwhelmed by this idea. The idea of being intentional just feels like another boulder or multiple boulders being put in the backpack of our life. Right? How can I possibly be more intentional about my faith when my head is barely above water with all of the other parts of my life? If that's you, I want you to know that the heart of God today is not to burden you, but rather to bring you into a place of peace and joy and freedom in Him. Very often, again, the thing we need to do when it comes to intentionality and to discipline is actually to stop, to be still, rather than take more on. I love what uh, the writer and thinker John Mark Comer says about this. He says, we must learn how to be with Jesus inside the contours of our everyday life, not an idealized version of the life we wish we had, used to have, or plan to have, but the life we actually have here, now, today. You see, friends, Jesus wants to meet with you in 2024, no matter what your life looks like. And what Psalm 1 tells us is that there are things we can recognize, things we can pay attention to, things we can be led towards that either will bring us closer to God or farther away from Him in this year. And what I want to do in the rest of our time is contrast an intentional life with an unintentional life. And I'm going to use a tool from John Mark Comer, who we just heard from, to do that. You might have seen me walk through a tool like this before, and if you have, stay engaged. Because actually, we need to hear this more than once. The nature of our life with Christ is that we tend towards entropy. We tend towards decay. We need moments like this, New Year moments, to realign and recalibrate with God. That's what this is about. Now, when it comes to the unintentional life, we should make no mistake. We are all the time being formed and shaped by different things. When we live our life by default, powerful forces are acting on us, but we just don't notice them. In the unintentional life, we are being formed, we are being shaped, we are worshiping things, but the thing that is doing that is not God, is not the Spirit, is not the way of Jesus, but rather the city that we live in, or the business that we work in, or the place that we go to school, or whatever our everyday environment looks like. That thing is impacting so many of the decisions that we make, our sense of self-identity, but we don't recognize them for what they are. What Psalm 1 calls that is living in the way of the wicked. Notice how in verse 1, so much of it is about what the blessed person doesn't do. In other words, the way of the wicked in the mind of the psalmist is this default plan. It's the unintentional life. That's what sitting with sinners and sitting with mockers is actually about. So what does that look like today? What is the unintentional life in 2024? Well, it's made up of at least three things. The first being the stories we believe, meaning the narratives that have taken hold of our mind. Whether that's our vision of the good life, what success looks like, whether financially or academically or in your career. It's the narratives or supposed truths that we've learned from our families of origin. Maybe some of those have even been triggered or you've been reminded of them in this holiday season when you've been visiting family. Things like my needs don't matter or whatever other people say about me is who I am. Or maybe I have to have the answer in any given situation. 
I was personally reminded recently how I have this false need to be seen as and in fact be competent and successful 100% of the time, which is of course completely unrealistic, but can so easily become the lens through which I view life. I'll avoid situations where I can't knock it out of the park and get an A plus, or I'll double down in some way when confronted with a very normal weakness or limitation. That's a narrative, that's a story I believe that isn't actually true. Those stories that we believe can also come from what we read or watch online or where we get our news. Billions of dollars are poured into shaping that in us every single month. It can also come from our political ideology. It has not escaped to, I'm sure, that 2024 is an election year, and what's true now will be even more true as the year goes on, which is that political narratives are trying their hardest to be the core story that you believe, whether or not they're aligned with the gospel of Jesus. So stories we believe, that's part of the unintentional life. They're acting on us whether we realize it or not. Another is our habits, in which we include our schedule. That the things we do repeatedly form a kind of muscle memory in us, whether that's always being in a hurry, or it's the places you shop, or the meals you eat, or the products you buy. All of those things have an impact on you and shape your default assumptions about life. It's funny, a few uh, months ago, I was talking with another person who's a transplant uh, from the United Kingdom, where I'm from. And at one point in the conversation, someone else asked us, would either one of you ever return to living back there in the UK? And it was hilarious because at the very same moment, both of us responded like this. We both said, I could never go back to the terrible customer service in that country. Now, what's going on there? Are me and this other person just weirdly synced up in our way of thinking, or is something else going on? Well, most likely what's going on is that we, over our many years of living here, have had our expectations shaped and formed by wonderful American customer service. You have that, if you didn't know. And so our habits and our schedule and our lives have been actually shaped by something to the point where we parrot the exact same response. Our habits and our schedule, our expectations, they form us in ways that we don't always realize. And so do our relationships. If you're a parent, At some point in your life, uh, a small child has probably repeated something in public that you would rather have kept private. Now, that's just not a small child thing. At a less obvious level, it's a human thing. We become like the people we spend the most time with. We say the things they say, we do the things they do. And actually, as I was preparing for today, I had this sense from the Lord that for someone or some people watching today, This part of the equation, this part of the unintentional life is actually especially important for you. That in some way, shape, or form, you are being actually negatively impacted by the people you spend a lot of time with. And maybe you've never thought about it or named it in that way. Maybe you've even excused it. You say, oh, that's just how so-and-so is. Or, well, in my industry, you just learn to absorb or ignore that kind of behavior. You've learned to tolerate something that's actually detrimental to you as part of this unintentional life by default on autopilot. And if that's you, again, there's encouragement for you in Psalm 1, especially that first verse, because our closest relationships really matter. They really shape our lives. So all these three things, the stories we believe, our habits and our schedule and our closest relationships, over the course of time, they change us. They form our character. They alter our priorities and our behavior. And so I wonder if just for a moment, at the beginning of this new year, would you just pause and reflect? Would you ask the Lord, are there any of these things that are speaking a louder word to me than you are? Are there any of these things that are forming and shaping my heart more than your gospel is? Even if I'm walking through hardship and I'm responding to hardship in your way or in this other way, have any of these things even subtly taken hold of me more than you have? Because the invitation of a follower of Jesus is to be less and less shaped by these things, by the world, and more and more shaped by him. So what does that look like? Let's look at, by contrast, the intentional life. And the intentional life was shaped less by these stories we believe, these narratives spoken over us and to us, and much more by scripture and teaching. 
This process of sitting under the many forms of biblical teaching that help us to refocus, to remind ourselves about what is true. Verse 2, the blessed one is one whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Not just in a learning right from wrong sense, but about getting into our bodies the, the vision and expectations and character of the abundant life that Jesus offers. It takes the stories that we've maybe allowed ourselves to believe or that have been pressed upon us and to dissect them and say what is true and what is not. Dr. Crawford Lawrence uh, says it this way. He says, part of the problem for Christians today is that the Bible has become a point of reference versus the context of my life. The Bible has become a point of reference versus the context of my life. We undo false narratives, lies and stories that are being put on us by what? Saying the Bible is the whole context of my life, not just one thing in a line of many. That's why gathering every single week is so critical because our minds, our hearts need counterformation against these stories through scripture and through teaching. Similarly, as contrasted with our habits and our schedule, we embrace instead in the intentional life spiritual practices and spiritual disciplines. Again, the things we do over and over and over again form something in us. It's like muscle memory. And so we want to do things, including in this series, that cultivate hunger and desire for what? For God. Over and above things like money, sex, and power. We want him over and above those other things, and these disciplines lead us towards that. The psalmist in verse 2 talks about this idea of meditating on the law day and night. That's a spiritual discipline. We want to do that in this series. And then finally, instead of just other relationships, whatever they might be, we focus instead on the new family of God. Again, the people we spend the most time with really matter both positively and negatively. And in the New Testament, the vision of the community of faith of the church is not just a group of people who get together once a week, listen to a TED talk, look at the back of someone else's head, maybe sing some songs. No, it's about a new heavenly family being formed together, whether a deep relationship, some mutual support, a mutual challenge. We need one another. That's the intentional life, these three things, scripture and teaching, spiritual disciplines and practices, the new family of God coming together. And when those things, when those things happen consistently, that's where we're led to abundance. When we journey even through trials and challenges together, it's when we experience what the psalmist calls the way of the blessed one. And so as we do that in these coming weeks, as we go through these different spiritual disciplines that shape and form our hearts, the hope is we can say an intentional yes to God with enthusiasm. Why? Because he's leading us in the way of the blessed one. Because he's leading us to the life of the blessed one. We can open ourselves up to him because of that this year. I wonder as we close, do you know today that God actually cares way more about your life in 2024 than you do. He really cares how this year is going to go for you. He sees your hopes. He sees your dreams. He sees the disappointments even of the past. And believe it or not, as much as you have hopes and dreams for yourself, he has better ones for you. He has healthier ones for you. He has even more abundant desires for you than you can generate for yourself. I don't say that in a health and wealth or prosperity gospel kind of way, but rather I say that to acknowledge what is true. And what is true is that God knows far better than we do what we need. God knows far better than we do what will actually lead us to peace and joy and assurance this year. He knows that better than we do, and he gave all of himself so that it would be possible. You see, the most amazing thing about Psalm 1 is that in order for it to be true for us, it first had to be untrue for Jesus. Jesus in his perfect life did everything, absolutely everything to walk in the way of the blessed one. But what did he receive instead? He received the inheritance of the wicked, judgment for our sin, separation from God that should be upon us, destruction and being made like the chaff that blows away. Why would he do that? 
he does that. Why? So that the way of the blessed one, the way of intentionally opening up ourselves to all that God has for us, for his presence and his goodness, Jesus did that so that we could receive it in his place, so that we could have life with him, so that we could follow in his way. That's the promise of the intentional life. And so I'd love for us to pray that we'd be open to that in this year that would be open to that intentional yes to God and his ways. So wherever you are right now, if you're in your home or your kitchen or uh, anywhere else, I'd invite you just to stand with me, to stand and make an intentional uh, signal even with your body that I'm saying yes to God this year. And let's pray right now. Lord, we thank you that the way of the blessed one is open to us because of the finished work of Jesus and his death and his resurrection. And so would you make us people who have hearts to say yes to it this year? We pray that you would replace unintentional voices in our lives with your voice. You'd help us to lay down things that don't lead us to life and to pick up all the things that you have for us instead. And so Jesus, we bless you today for opening this way to us. Help us to have open hearts to you. And it's in your name we pray. And we say together, amen. Amen. We're going to move now into a time of worship. So let's uh, press in. Let's find Jesus in every moment of these next songs. Let him turn it in. Watch him work it for your good. He's not done with what he started. He's not done until it's good. So let him turn it in your favor. Watch him work it for He's not done with what he started. He's not done until it's good. Hello, peace. Hello, joy. Hello, love. Hello, strength. Hello, hope. It's a new horizon. Hello, peace. Hello, joy. Hello, love. Hello, strength. Hello, hope. It's a new horizon. If you're ready for a breakthrough, he is. Just open up and just receive. Because what he's pouring.
Goodbye fear, goodbye guilt, goodbye shame. Goodbye pain, goodbye grave, it's a new horizon. Goodbye fear, goodbye guilt, goodbye shame. Goodbye pain, goodbye grave, it's a new horizon. Let the light in, let the light on in. Ooh, it's a new day. Let the light in, let the light on in. It's a new horizon. Let the light in, let the light on in. Forget the former. Let the light in, let the light on.
its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my name is whole. Jesus Christ, my name is whole. God, you are. in awe of the blessing that you pour into us and onto us and through us. And we thank you that as we go out from here, we can go with intentionality, with purpose, because of what you have done for us, because you are our living hope. And so we pray God's blessing, the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to be among you, to go with you, to bless you in the year 2024. God bless you all. Amen and amen. Curse. 
us we're under My heart sings hallelujah Everything changes Everything changes Oh, oh Glory, glory in the highest God We praise you, Savior Savior to the lost and broken Jesus, Jesus our Redeemer here to save us Our heart sings, heart sings hallelujah Here today love's incarnation
your mercy never fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest nights you are close like no other I've known you as a father i've known you as a friend i have lived in the goodness of god yeah. So, so good yes. Every breath that I am made I will say Of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after It's running after me Your goodness is running after me Running out. 